Okay, so uh, it's not only uh, entertaining, but I think we can uh, develop some research on the communication with plants, human communication with plants, because this music is also uh, the water crystal of Emoto, sensitive to the human presence and the mood of people which are surrounding the plants. So maybe it is we have to show the God will tell us what they think of us. Yeah. Ah, and, and, sorry. and how we can uh, deduce from their uh, behavior that perhaps we don't do very well with them. Now I'm going to speak about my present panelist, which is the future medicine. And also this is made possible by the collaboration with physicists and you could Emilio de Judice, Shuda and Giuseppe Tiello, which are uh, developing the idea that quantum <coughs> field physics could help understanding the effect of life in water and how life is recording in memory, because memory is really here and I'd like to thank the effort of the organizer of this meeting for the ten, ten times to make us learning a lot on the water structure and how it was possible to record information in organized water in life. We know that we are facing many important problems and how humanity is developing create new problems and now global warming is one of them, air and food pollution and the electromagnetic fog, fog in which we are living. And this will affect our health. Of course, health is concerned by aging but also by the development of chronic diseases, the new recurrent epidemics and the effect we are globalizing our germs. And this is particularly the fact of the new epidemics which are boosted by the exchange and travels, the expansion of demography, the global use of nutrients which are made from uh, pesticides from in water and so on. So this is a very, a very important problems, and not only that, but we are also facing chronic diseases, and the list is very long. But uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom of this slide. They are multifactorial, but in common there is oxidative stress, free radicals production, and infectious agent, and my training and my work in the last uh, the Gates has been focusing on infectious agent for viruses, but also now bacteria. So, of course, we are dealing with something which is very difficult to control because there are environmental factors, radiations, <coughs> chemical pollution of the air we are breathing. inadequate food, excessive physical exercise sometimes, tobacco smoke, alcohol, ischemia due to the cardiovascular dysfunctioning in the brain, parasitic infections, bacterial infection, viral infection, and all can accumulate and be added one to the other. So this will produce, to my opinion, most of the chronic disease we are facing now. Oxidative stress not only has some activating effect on many cells, but also on the cells of the immune system. So we will also see a decrease of our immune system. Maybe we are not as strong as our ancestors and that. 
and uh, this leads not only to a decrease but also a dysfunction especially the cellular immunity leave too much place to the humoral immunity. I'd like to show you now my own work, the work of my book, which is based on something molecular biology, biologists do not like. They think of molecular condition by contact. I'm not saying this is not occurring, of course, but I'd like to show you also there are probably molecular condition without close contact by wave and resonance. And we worked for the last 10 years on a new property of some bacteria, the viral DNA, which is the emission of low frequency electromagnetic waves by high volts of dilution of the DNA. So this is based on a very simple system actually designed by the Benvenist group, which was to use a sensor coil to detect a put electric potential to amplify this current and digitize it in a computer. So our menu, this, this has been shown in the, the, last, the last year, how we can develop dilution of water, or DNA water dilution from a very low concentration of DNA, 2 nanograms per mil, and at some dilution, which are still containing, the first dilution contained still some DNA molecule, but the 10 to minus 12 dilution do not contain any more DNA. But here we are shown that there are changes in the water structure the formation of nanostructure, which have the size of about 100 uh, nanometers or less, emitting frequency between the range of 1,000 3,000 hertz. And this is achieved by the excitation from the outside. Excitation could come from natural frequencies occurring on Earth, the surface of Earth, the Schumann resonance, which has 7.83 Hertz, but also we can use man-made generators. And if we excite properly, those that you show, they will emit signal we can record in the computer. So this looks like the electrocardiogram. It's not because this is in the scale of microseconds. And we can see that there are some change in the amplitude as compared to the noise. So this is a way to record what you quantitate in the system. But we also change, see change in the frequency. This is a MATLAB representation in colors of the different frequencies starting from 0 to 20,000 Hertz. And you can see the change in higher frequencies when there are signals. So we have been asking ourselves, and this is a question made by many of the my contradictors, people which like it but don't understand it, how the water can emit signals and how those signals represent the structure of the DNA. And finally we can recover, recover the DNA from that water. So how information is stored in the water, and again I like to stress the important work of uh, Emilio, the GDC, his colleagues, Giuseppe Vitiello, but I think now there is a large, larger school of people which are using the quantum field theory to explain the coherent domains of water molecules, but also <coughs> to explain the, I would say, the only main question of the universe. And I have some water. Thank you. This is the bulk of water, but we still need it. Mm -hmm. 
So we did many experiments and one showed clearly the transmission of the information by waves. We have a DNA a dilution, minus six, which express electromagnetic signals to one, and we excite with a, a generator of seven hertz, and in a second tube, which is close to the first one, we can see that uh, this tube will also emit signals at some dilution. Not only it will emit signal, but it will also show the DNA information recovered by retrieved by PCR in the tubes showing electromagnetic signals. So, so this was highly criticized because the people uh, just raised the question of contamination, but uh, we uh, showed that we could transmit this information recovered from the DNA tube was recorded in computer throughout uh, laboratory which were very distantly uh, working, not working at all on the DNA and were able to receive their signals to over to analog and uh, induce in a tube which was submitted to a magnetic field obtained by the electric coil uh, we should recover the DNA. The DNA, the same sequence. This was done with some uh, fragments of DNA which were uh, about 500 base pair long, complicants actually made by PCR. So they were very pure, and we could see that the DNA sequence was identical at one base difference. So this work was summarized in a paper recently published in Journal of Electromagnetics in Biology and Medicine. And as you can see, there are not only biologists, but many physicists, and this was dedicated to the memory of Emilio Del Giudice. I'd like to show you that this uh, now is interesting, of course, for the point of view of physics of explanation but also for the medical application. So I would like to now shift to the medical application, which is more in my domain. And you can see that we can detect in the plasma of patients suffering of many chronic diseases, signals which are coming from DNA of bacteria or viruses. AIDS was the case, the Lyme disease, autism, Alzheimer disease, Parkinson, multiple sclerosis, ALS, we are not really sure, stroke, schizophrenia, rheumatoid arthritis, and the list is totally not finished. But we focused our work mostly on uh, three diseases, AIDS, Lyme, and autism, and now we are attacking also the Alzheimer's disease. It was uh, interesting to note that in uh, the case of AIDS, the signals are not only coming from the virus, but also from a bacterial infection, which is highly correlated with HIV. But before that, of course, you may ask, why only those DNAs? Is normal DNA also emitting? Probably, but not at the same level. And we think there is probably correlation with the oxidative, oxidative stress which is uh, occurring in the, all of these diseases. And this oxidative stress will change probably some DNA base, not change in terms of mutation, but probably giving them a tag, which is always existing and transmitted from one molecule to another. And this is the case of the DNA retrieved from the water nanostructure it still have this property of emitting signals. So it's a tag which is epigenetic, at least. And why the microbial DNA only have this effect? Perhaps this is a new way for bacteria to persist in our body, with a, despite the effect we are using antibiotics, and our immune system also affecting them. 
So because those structures, the nanostructure of water will, have, will be completely invisible to the immune system and to the antibiotics. Only the vegetative forms, which could be derived from those structures, will be sensitive. So this is a very good model showing that how DNA could be amplified in water nanostructure and uh, retrieve, record, uh, retrieve, uh, re uh, resanitize in DNA from other cells. And this could amplify, of course, uh, in a very silent way, the persistence of the pathogenic information. Only pathogenic bacteria, and bacteria having a pathogenic potential, have this effect. If we use uh, probiotic, probiotic uh, bacteria, they don't emit. So this is really correlated with pathogenicity. I'd like to show you some examples now on AIDS, autism, Lyme disease, and cancer. So from the blood of AIDS patients, we are detecting bacterial electromagnetic signal from the red blood cells. Of course, he was very curious to focus on red blood cells because they don't they are claimed to be not to contain any DNA, but they contain at least some parasitic infection with some bact small bacteria, which was probably belonging to the, uh, were close to the rickettsia, to the rickettsia bacteria. We also are detecting viral signals. And here they are coming from the plasma, or the red blood cell, mostly from the plasma. So we can distinguish between the two signals, but also by the fact the bacterial EMS are coming from larger nanostructures, which are uh, the case of the bacteria, and they are larger than the nanostructure coming from the viral DNA. So we can also, by filtration, discriminate between the two. Filtration are also the origin of cells. Electron micrograph can show some of the potential, the possible rickettsia-like microorganisms. I have to say that they are also present in normal individuals, but the DNA is different. In the DNA of the rickettsia derived from HIV-infected patient, we see new sequence of DNA not existing in the healthy people. Those sequences are coming from genomic DNA. But the fact that they are present in the microorganism can be submitted to oxidative stress that those sequences are also emitting signals. So this table summarizes what we have found using PCR to detect the HIV DNA, also the bacterial cofactor DNA, using uh, primers for the 16S ribosome DNA. And you can see that in all HIV plus, there are not only the signal from the virus, but also from the bacterial DNA, and also from the cellular, which is present in the bacterial DNA, Factor called PIREC RBC. If you now look at HIV negative on the last on the last uh, column here, you see that HIV negative people, of course, have no viral DNA. They are no. They are sorry. They are the cofactor. Here, this is a mistake, zero, the covector is there. But the cellular, the DNA, cellular DNA sequences are absent in this cofactor. On the medium, this is an interesting observation, we worked on some, what they are called HIV controllers. They are people which have been infected with HIV so for a long time and do not show any sign of disease. So this is why they are, say, they are said to be controlling 
the HI infection for their whole immune system. Here we can detect the signal only from the plasma, from the HIV DNA, and not from the cofactor. The cofactor is there, but it does not emit signals. So this might suggest that this cofactor play a role in the disease itself, perhaps by inducing a higher oxidative stress, which will be able to activate more cells and only activated lymphocytes can uh, replicate completely HIV. So this may be a cofactor for HIV replication and their suppression could uh, perhaps help eradicating the infection or at least permitting the immune system control of this HIV infection. So this is an example of what we have done with some patients. This patient was treated by antibiotics for a long time, trying to remove the cofactor DNA. And here you can see the results in terms of molecular analysis. Uh, after almost one year of treatment, we could uh, see a disappearance of the cofactor DNA. The plasma, the HIV DNA was still there, but the red blood cells, red blood cells were not showing signs of the cofactor. But I'm not saying this is this is permanent. We have now stopped the treatment by antibiotics, and it seems that the cofactor is coming back. But during the peak of this appearance, we could see an increase, a significant increase of the CD4 lymphocyte number, which is almost the normal numbers. So this is encouraging us to continue this kind of uh, therapeutics. And I say these patients were uh, always on the continuous therapy therapy. So, uh, this is something which is beyond the treatment. Beyond the treatment decreases very much the viral load in the blood, the viral RNA load, but does not affect very much either the cofactor DNA, but also the virus DNA we detect, we are detecting in the plasma. So perhaps the future of medicine in the case of HIV infection is that we can add some antibiotic treatment or some other types of treatment which could remove the cofactor or decrease the cofactor and this may lead to eradication of HIV infection. Now I'm turning to another disease, autism. And here we can show also this is controversial, not accepted by many people, but there are facts and I'll show you the facts are very consistent showing that there is probably a microbial connection between the gut, the blood, and the brain. And this is based also on the work of the group of Jan Lipkin at Columbia University in New York, showing the detection of another, a novel, not a novel, but a species not previously recognized in the gut of children, Suterella, and the accompanying species which are present, which were found present in biopsy samples from children with autism and gastrointestinal disturbance. So we started from this work showing that also the blood can contain that the DNA of that new species we can detect either by PCR or by the emission of electrolytic signals. So we have uh, done with our physician colleagues from France, Italy, and all other European countries, and some children were from the United States. So showing this uh, study probably uh, covers most of the autistic children in the world. We found in 150 autistic children, 85% in their plasma had electromagnetic emission. And 82% were positive for the PCR for Soturella. 
using specific primers. In comparison, we have also studied the another microorganisms micro which were supposed to be present in patients, uh, in autistic children, but here the percentage is not very significant. It's only significant for Suturella, 82% compared to 9% in the group of healthy children. So this, of course, led to treatment, and we could see a decrease of the electromagnetic signal emission by antibiotic treatment. This is an example of a child who was first treated by azithromycin, showing the decrease of the intensity of the signal according to time, but it was not complete, and so we decided to use another type of antibiotics to come. Obtain at, again some decrease of the intensity of the electromagnetic signals. And the interesting thing is that the symptoms were also partly changing, decreasing here, and the child starts speaking at the end of this trip. And for that, this, uh, children was, this child was. Uh, sent to another country in which was not possible to continue the treatment. But we have all other examples. Here is an example of a Russian child uh, living in the United States. He was treated by antibiotics. And when I say treatment by antibiotics, it's not simply treating by one or two antibiotics, actually accompanying the treatment by other treatments against parasites, fungi and uh, this is a very complex uh, protocol which is now masterized by a group of clinicians in France and Italy. Here you can see that during the treatment by antibiotics you see a decrease of the intensity of the electromagnetic signal and also the, the PCR the, the PCR Sorry. The PCR disappear during the treatment. Again, we're not sure this is uh, definitive because it's possibly we haven't completely eliminated the, the germs which could uh, survive probably in tissues some tissues and the possibility that it will come back when we stop the treatment is high. But again, we see during that treatment an improvement, I'm not saying a cure, an improvement of the clinical symptoms, which sometimes are very spectacular. The child starts speaking, where we very well, not at all deciding not to speak at that level. So this is encouraging to continue this research. We show that perhaps how this may be cured by this use of this new by the use of this new technology. So to summarize what could happen in this disease but also in probably in the other degenerative diseases. Probably the origin is uh, dysfunctioning of the immune system of the child with some genetic predisposition. This will lead to oxidative stress, some immunosuppression linked to this oxidative stress, and the development of some new bacterial agents not present or present to a very low level in uh, healthy children. Again, this infection will uh, lead to more oxidative stress, more signals, and they, of course, we have also to assume that the bacterial, but the intestinal mucosa is open to the passage of some bacteria to the blood and from the blood to the brain. Again, perhaps also there is an increase of permeation of the brain barrier, brain blood barrier, so that some products of the bacteria can go to the neurons, to the brain. It's possible that the N 
their induction of somatic mutation in the known DNA, and even a prion effect which will expand the, the lesions. So probably this st stage will be irreversible, and we have to use antibiotics at the early stage of the infection. Another example is the Lyme. Lyme disease is also an epidemic now, expanding very fast in many world countries. The origin of the Lyme disease is Borrelia, Borrelia burgdorferi, which show polymorphism, <coughs> which make it difficult to treat by antibiotics because some of the forms are f fully resistant to antibiotics, or to some of them. And it will persist for years. Actually, the Lyme Borrelia is aspiricated, spirochated, close to the syphilis agent. And like the syphilis agent, you can, at the latest stage, go to the brain and persist there for years, but inducing dementia or no recall sign. And again, it induces strong oxidative stress. Just to show you some picture my colleagues showing that it is like a embryonic bacterium, but also on the right you can see a global form show, uh, shorter, which represents a, a kistic form, which is highly resistant to many antibiotics. This is a higher magnification of this uh, kistic form bound to a spirochete-like form. So here we design a highly sensitive PCR to direct it to the 16S ribosomal DNA and sometime to increase the sensitivity we use nested PCR using two types of primers. The actually the Primers used for the nested, we also, they were, were also used for simple PCR, just by increasing the number of cycle of amplification, 40 to 70, we could also obtain a very high sensitivity detection. And this is an example of showing the persistence of this infection for many, many years. This was denied by many uh, member of the medical community, but this is real. We can detect by PCR after years of uh, persistence of this infection. So this example showed that the patient was uh, antibiotic from the tick in 2003. He showed a erythema migrans, which is uh, early sign of this infection. And ten years later, he showed neurological signs and also the, effect, the, the joints were affected. He had antibiotic treatment and he was improved. We have undergone a study with some physicists from, the, from Alsace in France in which there are many, many cases of Lyme disease. And this study showed that our PCR and also the MS, the, the electromagnetic signal detection, was highly positive in the majority of the patients studied blindly. They show 85% positive for electromagnetic signals, 82% for PCR, in the case of Otis for Sturella, and in the case of Lyme. For Borrelia, we show 82% of EMS and 64% positive for PCR. So this technology of detection of signals uh, can be, uh, to my opinion, developed at the clinical level and used by many laboratories, clinical laboratories, that is very difficult. We are now a robot are using a robot to make the dilutions. And so, uh, even a single drop of blood would be sufficient to make the analysis. We are using now four or five mils of blood, but we can use also a drop. 
And the interest of the drop also for Borrelia is that we can detect by dark field microscope the agent swimming in the, in the blood. Now, the last application of this, an unexpected application of this, was the fact that you could use this amplicon obtained by ECR of the 16S ribosomal DNA, the second types of amplicon, 499 base pair, to not only transduce this information in a tube of water, but also in living cells. So the first step was to record the signals and store it in a digital form into a computer file, and then in the second step, organize the transduction from the computer, transform again to analog the, the signals, and this is what was transformed into electric current modulating the magnetic field in a coil of a flask of culture of cell culture. I already mentioned this at the last meeting, but we are pursued, of course, in this uh, study and show that uh, the effect is very high in cell or tumoral origin. So after 10 days of exposure in uh, 37 degrees, we can see that the, the cells of tumoral origin died on the right part of this bottom you see in red are the dead cells, in green are the living cells, and you can see 10 days later, most of the living cell cells disappear, and the number of dead cells very much increase. At the same time, if we do the PCR for this Borrelia 16S DNA, we can see it is synthesized in the living tumor cells at day five, six, and seven. No, uh, this is a control in the same line without the signals. So we pursued this study in many cell lines showing that cell lines from lymphoma, breast cancer, glioblastoma, all show this capacity to transduce, to synthesize the DNA when they receive the signals. So probably this is mediated by some organized water inside the cells and also probably by mitochondria. It is quite possible that the polymerase enzyme, which is able to read the signals, is the polymerase tree from mitochondria, indicating probably one of the main changes in cancer is the change in mitochondria. This is an old story, actually. Otto Warburg in the 1920s showed that uh, the glycolysis uh, in cancer cell that's very high and bypassing some of the uh, main uh, pathway of ATP synthesis. So it's quite possible that this, and there are also arguments from, therapeut from therapeuts, from doctors, which have been studying the effect of inhibitors of mitochondria in cancer cells. It is quite possible this is one of the major signs of the tumor cells compared to the normal cells. Here we have studied MRC5, which is a well-known embryonic fibroblastic cell line. We use also activated trinophocytes from blood donors. Also some parachymatosis, parachymatosis stem cells. They were all negative for this capacity. Of course, this may be just a matter of degree. We don't uh, show. And if we increase the sensitivity, we will detect something also in normal cells. But so far, the detection has been made in uh, normal in tumor cells only, and uh, there are cell lines going well in vitro. But some of them are derived from fresh tissues from patients. So this is an interesting line of research which uh, might also to lead to new types of treatment of cancer. So my conclusion would be that 
we are now new tools to detect chronic infection at a very low level, thanks to the emission of signals from the water nanostructure and used by pathogenic agents. So this will lead to more prevention and prediction at the early stage of people, and this may lead to treatment which can reverse the effect of those pathogenic agents if we can succeed in eradicating them or putting them in very low levels so that the immune system which will be controlling them, like in the uh, controller of HIV infections. This also include personalized treatment as opposed of statistical treatment and considering not the disease but the patient itself. And finally this will need 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 we need participation of the patients. Uh, it should be behave in a very, very responsible way to avoid the risk factor of the environment to which he is exposed. So this is I believe the only future of medicine and it will be perhaps surprised perhaps in one hundred years to see that the waves from water will be very important in medicine. Thank you.